of ways that this conversation can go. So kind of the principles I set up for myself is to try and keep this like short and interactive and interesting. Um, if people have questions along the way, I'd really like you to guide me a little bit because you know when I think back about being being in high school, um, as Professor Miller mentioned, I grew up down the street and I went here for two years. And I'm not recommending that you guys do this, but I actually I actually left Blair for my sophomore year. Um, my head was just in a different kind of place and. My whole life, I've probably done things a little bit out of order, which is how you didn't find yourself doing something like trying, you know, building companies or being involved in the Silicon Valley technology scene, which is where you're you're supposed to go to California and San Francisco and Palo Alto, you know, to build the next Google or the next Facebook, or the next Twitter or whatever kind of a thing. And um, for whatever reason, five years or so ago, Detroit really called my interest as a place where here's a great American city that's provided so much to the United States of America and has fallen on such hard times over the last really five or so decades, it has almost fallen completely out of the American consciousness, I feel like, right now, except for kind of like ambiently bad news that you kind of hear about it. But does anybody here have, anybody have firm opinions, or anybody here, does anybody here not have any thoughts about Detroit at all? Maybe it's kind of an interesting thing. Prior to this talk, just kind of like, Detroit's a city that begins with a D, you know, and is, is uh, in the Midwest somewhere, you know, we got, okay, we got an honest person over here. So, that was actually one of my initial interests in Detroit as well, was kind of this recognition being a certain point in my life where I really loved inventing things for the internet, in, inventing technologies for this new network where every person in the seven billion, you know, person 25,000 mile around world can all be on the same network communicating with each other with, you know, things that now exist inside of our pockets. And wondering why that kind of innovation wasn't coming back to some of what they call like the Rust Belt cities in America, or cities that maybe outlived their original purpose, like, Detroit has in a lot of ways. Um, so first off, I've come to kind of refer to Detroit as like the west coast of the eastern time zone. I think it's important to show like even the geography of where Detroit is at. It's actually not that far from where we are right now. Uh, Mary and I drove here. It takes about nine hours in a car. Uh, it's a very short uh, plane trip. Here we are at Blair, coming down to Detroit. Uh, western to the eastern time zone ends around here. Actually, the reason it ends there is because back when Detroit was really inventing and then producing automobiles and the machinery to help us win, uh, helped the U.S. win World War II, it needed to sync up with New York because it was every bit as important as cities like New York. And over the last few decades, I think we've forgotten kind of that context of the city. And uh, something else to notice that's kind of unique is that Detroit is actually north of Canada. So this is Canada ducking down in here. When you're in Detroit, kind of the south end of the, the city actually vanishes into, into another country right here. So it is an inter international city um, as well. And uh, if I zoom in a little bit on the, the uh, Google Maps here, I mean, you'll see it's still a city. A lot of people, and I'll talk tonight about a lot of light and a lot of vacancy and a lot of residential kind of hardships in the city. But when you go there, I think people are always surprised that Detroit is like both better and worse right now than you think. I mean, you look at Bell and you're like, oh, this is amazing. The buildings are amazing. The skyscrapers are huge. You know, this is every bit as cool as like walking around, you know, Manhattan and parts of this stuff. It's impressive. You know, you see that something amazing has happened there and it's still happening there. And then of course, unfortunately, there's too many places you can go to that are too close that where you can't believe that that's even allowed to exist. The situations are so bizarre. You know, houses that are missing doors, windows, collapsed, burned out, and really nobody's, nobody is, people are paying attention to these things, but they've not been able to address them, you know, quickly enough. So, I don't want to talk too much about the history of Detroit. I feel, feel like there's one thing to kind of frame some of the issues I'm talking about, which is important to look at. It's the overall population signature of Detroit. It kind of tells the story of the city. So if you look, you know, if we go back, um, you know, 100 years, you know, still a very small city. It's maybe, you know, less, less than a quarter of a million people, maybe a little bit more. And you see the city is essentially a gigantic flash mob. And so the, the flash mob here was caused by people that were moving to Detroit to, you know, get some of the things that Detroit invented, right? So Henry Ford, you know, the automobile, the assembly line, organized labor, a whole bunch of things that are incredibly futuristic, but we don't really, you know, we think about technology these days as kind of like, you know, something that somebody's gonna code inside of a website and not like the massive organization of people to invent robots that whip us around at 80 miles an hour from city to city. But not that long ago, that was incredibly futuristic and unbelievable. And Detroit was one of the key cities that kind of brought that to life. But you see, as, as the economics of the city changed, the city started to evacuate pretty much as quickly as people came into the city. And also, you can't really talk about Detroit, I don't think, with, without talking about a very unfortunate social dynamic and that the city has a long, unfortunate history of social injustice and racial 
um, miscommunication, I guess would be like one way you could say it. it. actually goes a lot deeper than that. And I don't want to harp on it too much tonight, or we, we, can, we can talk about any questions, but it's not the focus of the talk. Just to talk about demographics in Detroit right now, Detroit currently is 85% African American. It's the blackest city in the country, however you want to say. And if you look at the signature of how things have changed in the city, that is a relatively recent development that's set against the backdrop of a lot of white people leaving the city and what sometimes gets called white flight. And this was kind of people leaving the city to, to move out to the suburbs. And uh, that sets a really interesting backdrop for the city as itself and people from the outside are interested in redeveloping Detroit. What's a socially just way to do that when the population consists largely of people who <laughs> moved there for opportunity because they weren't getting it, they weren't, weren't being treated fairly elsewhere. So that's, that's a backdrop to stuff happening in Detroit. Mm. Um, my understanding was that you were shown like maybe like a minute clip of this, uh, this video um, that kind of talks about this, this large scale effort to photograph and document and digitize um, what's going on with every single property in the city of Detroit. And I do want to show either for those that, that missed it or to kind of put us back into the context of what this looked like. Here's where, here's where I'll step aside for a second and get back on um, kind of the, the trajectory of Love Lane in Detroit. So um, when Mary and I started working on this project, it was really just me, Mary, our partner Larry, with essentially what was an insane idea. You know, I was brand new to the city of Detroit. This is, you know, maybe five and a half, six years ago. Had a ridiculous concept to try and engage with what were some insanely cheap properties in the city. So I don't know if you guys have, have heard the story of the dollar house or the five hundred dollar house in, in Detroit. And these were things, kind of again, not knowing about the city, kind of looking in from the outside, going like, how can such a situation <coughs> exist? How can you have a house that costs a dollar or five hundred dollars? You know, or a vacant lot that costs a dollar or five hundred dollars. So we kind of came up with this ridiculous conceit. It was well intentioned. I don't think it's a bad thing, but it was just it was just very playful. And the idea was that for a dollar, you could own a property in Detroit, but the property was only a square inch big. And the idea was that using the internet, you can try and essentially crowdfund, like you might see on Kickstarter, or you might invite a social network of people in to each like contribute a tiny amount of money for a, a, a very tiny property in the city. It was sort of a playful experiment. And what we ended up doing from that was kind of building these interactive mapping systems where we realized that once we had built a map for people who were had these tiny little inch sized properties, and it's okay to put some tension out or laugh or smile at that, because it was a really kind of ridiculous thing, you know, running around town, town trying to set this up. But um, in, the, in, the, in the course of doing it, we actually hit upon some really interesting innovations, both for having, inviting people to collaborate around vacant properties in the city, and then also building some technological tools where you could like log into a map and see who your neighbors were and see who owned every property. And essentially what we evolved into over time was injecting the maps that we made for inches with life-size property information about the city of Detroit. So like, rather than like, here's this little tiny inch grid of like, inch investors who, you know, have these little tiny spaces in the microhood around you, it was like, here's every property in, in a neighborhood or in a zip code or in a council district or in the entire city, here's who owns everything. Here's, here's what we know about all these properties. And so Detroit is the kind of city that as you walk down the street will make you ask these questions like, who owns that? Like, who do I talk to about cleaning that up? Who who do I talk to if I want to if I want to move into that house and fix it up? You know, who do I talk to if I want to use that vacant lot for a garden or event space or something like that? So we developed a website called Why Don't We Own This, which essentially was like X-ray glasses for seeing who owned every property in the city of Detroit, and that became such a kind of an essential community resource for people who were really urgently trying to ask that um, of themselves and, and of the city so they could fix and heal and rehab properties around them, that we became sort of accidentally like an essential city service of sorts. People know, knew to come to Loveland to look that kind of stuff up. And from that work, this is funny how things work out, Again, this is approaching things from kind of like a not necessarily you know, straightforward path. Last fall, we got a call from, not from the White House directly, but sort of. So we got a, we got a call from a blight task force group that was brought into existence at the behest of the White House where Obama and his cabinet advisors were trying to figure out a way to be helpful to the city of Detroit, as it was the largest American city to ever enter bankruptcy. Um, a lot of, see, it's such a gnarly story, I don't want to get too distracted from it, but you know, it entered uh, bankrupt, municipal bankruptcy, a uh, whole lot of questions about how to sort that stuff out, and, and the country was trying, the federal government was trying to figure out how they could help Detroit without essentially writing it 
just a big check. Like, oh, how much are you guys in debt? 18 million dollars. Here's a check for that. But keep on doing what you're doing. So they were trying to be a little bit more thoughtful about how they could be supportive. And one of the areas that they identified as really needing assistance was the blight problem in Detroit. So pull this back up for a second. One thing I didn't mention here is that if you have two million people that move into an area and you build housing for them, and they're making good money working at their industrial jobs, and then those people leave, guess what gets left behind there? You've got a lot of property that gets left behind. You've got a lot of uh, structures that get left behind. You've got a lot, you've got a lot of lots that get um, left behind. And you essentially have too few people for too many properties. So blight being a massive issue, we, we got brought in, and they sat us down, and they said, you know, we're, we're starting to explore the issue of blight. If you guys could do one thing to help us get on top of the blight problem in Detroit, which is the biggest blight problem in the United States of America, what would you guys do? And I think this is, gets really interesting for, for people who are kind of thinking about careers or being entrepreneurs or kind of like wondering like what kind of time you live in. There's all sorts of things that are newly possible, and at every point in time there are things that are newly possible, but right now there's a lot with information technology that makes things newly possible. So for years people were grinding on this problem of how to get on top of this blight issue and kind of even manage the information. Because like you'd one way, you know, Detroit has all these overlapping crises, economic crises, social crises, blight crises, but underneath it there's also an information, uh, information crisis. Like literally nobody in the city knew what was going on with these properties. You could try, but it was all on paper, somebody hand you, somebody they wrote down about their neighborhood, the problem, so nobody was able to capture it all. So what we presented was like, look, it's newly possible right now. We could give Detroit <laughs> residents an app on their phone they could actually go and they could visit every property in the city and they could tell you but also show you what's blighted and vacant. And so we were sitting around with all these, you know, big wigs and, and head honchos from the federal government and the, the treasury and, you know, business leaders from, from all over Detroit and stuff. And it was kind of like a moment of silence where it's like, is that a good idea to do? Like, do you think it? And it's like, duh, like, of course, you, you have to do that. Like if you're serious about solving the problem, like that's the kind of stuff that you have to do. You can't address a problem until you can see what's going on with it specifically. So the long story short, or the long story medium long after all that leading up to it, I want you to show this video, which is sort of the, which captures scenes from the actual getting, you know, 150 Detroiters for this, this citywide survey that we hired out into the field, photographing their own city, and then some of the people who brought the project together, kind of talking about it. And then I want to dive into the the data that we found, the photography that was captured, and um, uh, and open the dialogue, and, and frankly ask you guys some questions too, because we spent a lot of time with our nose down in Detroit. I know some of this stuff might sound kind of crazy. Yeah, I went to yeah. one thirty in the school meeting and wanted to do that, please. Sure, let's see. So I one thirty. This is this is partly too. So I'm not sure what words going to come out of his mouth first. But this is also partly just to give some color on this kind of situation because this wasn't intense. Almost like sometimes it's like a. It's like Detroit's moon landing in some ways. You had a massive mission control center where people were coming in and then being dispatched all over the city to visit every single property. <coughs> so to kind of bring my words and the technology of like, here's a little bit more color image <coughs> from the streets and such. What you need to do is attack it right away. You can't oh, wait, just put it out section. Oh, wait, you can plug that piece in. Is, um, let's see. Oh, Raz. the microphone. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. There you go. Raz, Hey, Raz? Yeah. There's now a coordinated approach to removing all blight within the city of Detroit. It was important that residents that live in each of these neighborhoods had an opportunity to get involved. We took teams of residents and sent them out to the city to survey their own neighborhoods and understand exactly what's going on. The surveyors, they came in in the morning, they got their tablets, they would meet up with their teams, get their assignments of what area of the city they were going to be going to, get in the cars with their drivers, drive to that area, and they'd start taking pictures of every single house. They had a very specific set of criteria that they were looking to evaluate each building on. Is there a housing site? Yes. Um, is there anything shown? Yes. Okay. Okay. Can First time had real time information coming out about property information in the city, feeding into a system that was combined with data from the city, the county, the state, and even the feds to really understand what's going on in the city. If you don't have the data, then it's really difficult to come up with recommendations that make any sense. If we're going to have an incredible amount of information about how to actually use data driven decisions to fight flight in the city of Detroit. Once the 
life is removed, all sorts of potential and possibilities will exist. Kids are going to go to law school and have to worry about what's in that abandoned house next to them. Property values are going to go up. We can be proud of our city once again and our neighborhoods. It can totally change the quality of life for people in an entire neighborhood. Once we start moving the light, I think everyone in the world is going to see what Detroit's really made of. Does anybody have any questions about how that, that process worked on hands or worked? So uh, out, outfitting um, Detroiters to go visit every single property um, in the city and um, essentially creating a dashboard now that has gone from um, really having no insight whatsoever um, for other than knowing, oh, question right here, yeah, yeah. It was a great question. So, so essentially, what he asked, um, how do we get the people to get together and do it? And um, so we paid them which was helpful in part of this, right? But also the who, who showed up were people that were passionate anyway. So um, we paid ten, people $10 an hour to do the initial survey, so they visited 400,000 properties in essentially 30 working days. And what that's added up to in Detroit right now is that they've actually, the city has decided to keep on um, an 11 person staff of like full-time surveyors. So right now, every single day, they've got people who are paid to go and visit all the houses that unfortunately caught fire the day previous. They people going and double checking on all the properties that demolition contractors say have been torn down. They have people going and checking on properties that neighbors write in and say, hey, can you come take a look at this thing? You know, some, something bad happened you know, behind this house. And so um, the payment part is really interesting. So it's kind of cut through, like, I should have said this earlier probably, that one of the things that's been amazing about this work is it's not just technology like, hey guys, here's a website that can help you look up resources a little bit better. The idea was really like, how do you build community engagement and resident involvement into a technological program? So this, this app that we use, Blexting, is actually available on the, on the App Store. You guys can download it as well, although it really only works in Detroit right now, but if you wanted to, it's, it's on the Apple and the Android App Store. And so if you download Blexting, you pull up your neighborhood essentially in the app, and you see how everything has been surveyed, what the city knows about your area. And so if you see something is not right, in either direction, if you see a property is marked as like a problem property, or if you see it's not, and it's the opposite thing, you can actually go and update that information, and there's a staff of people, like moderators on the web forum, sit there and actually review all that stuff as it comes in. And what, what it's added up to for the city as an interface right now, and this is, this is all available currently on MotorCityMapping.org, this is 100% downloadable and, and viewable by the public. Um, here, here's, here's the city of Detroit. Um, here's kind of like a really top level dashboard for every property in the city over here. And so, so if you look, you know, at the, at the aggregate, it's not incredibly useful, but it still gives you interesting things. So if you look here, structure occupancy, right? So surveyors have found that there are almost exactly 50,000 unoccupied buildings in the city of Detroit, and a number more that fall into the, got cut off a little bit on this screen here, but 11,000 that fall into this kind of possibly unoccupied category. If you kind of click around the top level, you can look at which neighborhood is made be experiencing more or less of this kind of situation. But if you click down to a neighborhood, like here we are in the, in the Brightmore neighborhood, um, you, know, you, can, you can view similar stats just for this space, or you can go down and you can really explore granularly for things. So, you know, again, this being something that both residents and the city uses, in this case, we're looking in this neighborhood for every structure that is in poor or suggest demolition condition and all these, um, all these parcels that have popped up on the right fit that criteria. So as you click through these on here, you've gone from a situation of not having any sort of quantification, any sort of insight, no x-ray glasses to actually see what needs to be worked on, to being able to get so granular that I can go, like if I want to go back here into this neighborhood and say, you know, show me all the structures that have fire damage on here. And if we're connected to the network, well, yeah. So if I go down, this is always nerve-wracking to actually click on some and see if they're actually correct on here. So you know, here's a house with fire damage. And also, by, by looking at this, this gives you a sense too of how distressed certain areas, too many areas of the cities are right now, right? Like you should, you should have to look at. Um, I mean, this is just one neighborhood. Let's go to, you know, I'll go somewhere else. We'll click over to Burbank here, right? And I'll click in this area. I'll say, you know, show me, show me every structure that needs boarding. And it'll think for a second, because it's got to look through a lot of that data. But the thing to keep in mind here is, as far as, as, a, as a system that we built for the city, the, um, 
This isn't like we just did this once and these properties in which they surveyed the same. These get updated, not everything every day, but these get updated every day by surveyors that work for the city or individuals who care or community groups who care. So if I go down and I click on one in here, yep, there's the board over the window. Yeah, here's the front door open on stuff. And it's almost, I don't know, it's still, we, we try to make these things as human as possible, but I think you can get the sense too by looking at, look, that's, that's just, that's a neighborhood. We do this in, in neighborhood after neighborhood in the city right now, unfortunately, where to like click a button that says, show me a restructure that's in need of boarding, show me everything with fire damage, show me anything empty. You shouldn't, it's not right to see this many things. And so really like what we're, what we're facing here, it's hard to say because everybody tries to act like these things are normal, and uh, Professor Miller and I were having an interesting conversation before the, the talk tonight, how it seems like it's hard to capture people's imaginations by, about problems that exist in the U.S. or urban problems that exist in American cities. Um, but what we're looking at here, you know, I think it is a, is a powerful approach to a problem that's almost, almost something so big you can't even get your mind around how bad this is. And trying to build tools to enlighten people about the scale of it and, um, and make, um, processes for working on it intelligent. And so, you know, for one example of things, let's talk through all these. So when you're, when you're the city looking at this information, um, you're trying to get a good sense of like, okay, so here's our blight map. Now we can see what everything is, it's quantified. Like, what do we actually do about it? Like, certain properties just need to be torn down, right? They need to be demolished or they need to be deconstructed and recycled. Um, certain properties can be rehabbed and reoccupied. Um, certain properties can just be sold to a neighbor or can be sold to somebody who reaches out and says, hi, I'm a developer, I'm an investor, I want to work on this. And certain properties should be put into some form of public trust or park system or some or assembled for some sort of public use. And so essentially what's happening in the city right now that we have the front row seat to is probably the world's biggest non-war caused um, city redevelopment program for lack of a better term, which is very interesting because, because it wasn't an event or, or a non-weather event. Because it hasn't, because it wasn't, you know, a, a, a hurricane like Katrina and it, and it wasn't a bomb, it's a more normal situation, but it's not right, it needs to be fixed urgently, but we still deal with the issues of life going on normally, I guess you would say, um, around it. So, uh, have, okay, question, yeah, please. Can I ask a totally selfish question? Can you take a look at 2679 Boeing? Because that's my own outfit. Yeah, absolutely. So, let's see. Let's see, 2679 Boeing, G-O-L-I-N. G-O-L-I-N. G-U-O. Cards, can you tell everyone why you were there? I lived, I lived in Detroit for five years uh, and taught in the schools for four years. Okay, so it looks like that might be a duplex piece on, is that, that still going right? I'm not familiar yeah. with the streets yeah, on that. Yeah. So let's see, so 2710, 216, or one of these, sometimes with duplex numbers like that, where it's a multiple unit piece. Yeah, that's never. So, and you, that was in a pretty, you were, you were in a pretty nice spot on the riverfront there. That's the Central Park of Detroit, right over here. Um, which five years were you in town? 02 to 07. 02 to 07? Okay. And you said you emailed me about something previously? What, what was that? When I was visiting the summer. Okay, all right. Sorry, sorry, didn't pick up. But um, so, okay, so let's see. Um, from here, I could take the conversation in a, in a couple different ways. I'm trying to figure out what would be most interesting. Yeah, I'll get back. What what what's happening on the Canadian side of the river? Has that had the same decline in occupancy and 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 uh, war-like conditions? You yeah, great great question. Um, I would say that it's a, uh, a near total lack of coordination. So there's the, the just, just meaning that, um, well, I guess the first answer to that, sorry, is that you know, it's not like Detroit on the other side. Windsor is the city on the other side of the river. Um, some Canadians call it the Detroit of Windsor. It's kind of like a sort of a dismissive way to say that it's not like the most maybe currently action packed. Like they have their own kind of like, you know, vacancy and city revenue problems but it doesn't have Detroit like scale of problems. And there's surprisingly, it, it's the most heavily trafficked international border crossing between the US and, and another country. But there's not a lot of cultural 
because as Americans, we find it hard to look across the border and see relative greater wealth other than Niagara Falls, Canada, and Niagara Falls, New York, where you see two sister cities where one is declined and one is prospered. Right, so yeah, and here, maybe it has, goes back to that kind of twilight zone nature of Detroit being north of Canada. I don't know what happened. Right? But, um, hmm. um, so, so kind of washing off from here, I guess, one, one thing I'll say, if people want to come in with questions or, or lead a conversation on stuff, because kind of, we can either talk more about the, the city, you know, we can talk more about where, like, um, like, tools and technologies like this are going, or could kind of, like, talk about, you know, some of the, um, more of the kind of goings and goings on and workings of, of the city itself, but I, I'll, in lieu of that, talk about you know what, where we see this kind of like headed. So D Detroit's not the only place that could benefit, I think, from such a you know such a, a, a tool or technological platform or a survey. So one of the things that we're really excited about doing is putting more um, cities and, and um, counties and states online in the same fashion. So our team is trying to think, like, okay, like, what would it look like if we could build X-ray glasses for property information for the entire country? So you know the same way that you, um, you know, get to you once, one second, right? okay? So the, uh, now I got my train of thought kicking on that. So you know, we all, I don't know if you guys remember your first experience with Google Maps or something. Sort of the first thing you do is you kind of type in your address, I think, to like see what your house looks like on it. And it's a really amazing thing. I don't know if anybody sees any um, cities on here that anybody is from. But it's, a, it's an amazing thing to be able to get down to where you live at and kind of turn on these x-ray glasses for like, who owns everything in your city? You know, what condition are things in my city? And what does foreclosure look like in my city? You know, even conceivably something as silly sounding but like sort of transformative as like, show me every red house in my city. Which is, you know, something that, that sounds kind of goofy but one of, the, one of the tools that we're working on right now is, is um, I'm sure you guys are familiar that Google drives these street view cars through, you know, every street in America, you know, basically, it's very rare to not see, um, you know, place covered unless it's very, very rural. And um, the same way that we had surveyors go out with tablets and visit every property in Detroit, we've actually built a system which is not live yet, but which is, we're really excited to put out next year to try to, to get people excited about surveying, you know, eventually every property in the, in the United States of America where, uh, so here we are, we're, in a, we're in a, you know, looking at a property in New Orleans right here where essentially what the activity is, is I got my little Google guy over here, you know, and I line myself on the, on the parcel properly and I can, I can zoom in to get my photograph of the property, you know, via street view rather than actually being there. And I can go up here, I can say, you know, yep, it's a structure, it's a residential, residential structure, it's in good condition, and it is occupied, and if I want to say something, seeing as simple as like white like house and submit it, that goes on to the same kind of a map. And so what we're kind of moving towards, um, and this may sound a little futuristic, but I feel like something that we've certainly seen work in Detroit, and it both kind of excites and, and frightens us and makes us think big about you know, where this is going to go. Next is, you know, imagine you're not only looking at Detroit right now, but you're you're looking at the U.S. and maybe you're looking at another country, and you're saying, you know, you're saying, show me every foreclosure in the United States of America. You know, show me everything of a certain kind of quality here, and what those kinds of X-ray glasses might reveal about the world we live in and the cities we live in, and how we might use space differently or engage with the world around us differently. So, um, you know, with that, I don't know if anybody else has any kind of questions. Um, yeah. That's a great question. So the um, immediately what the city did, so I mentioned before there's like there's options for properties. Like right once you can see it all, it's like you kind of tap first what, you should, what the city try, tries to do is like tally up like what do we think has no other future besides being flattened and thrown out, unfortunately, right? But that's like that's an option for some things. You know, you see those pictures of the buildings that have um, you know incredible fire damage. And I'll pull up this, I'll pull this up in the background while we talk here. This is um, um, our, our colleague Alex makes these uh, very sad but very poignant and very sort of in your face, here's the problem in action um, kind of photo series that show, you know, here again, this is the street view. You know, here's a house in 2009, 2011, 2014, 
and then burned. And so these things kind of move quickly. So the future, future of some of these places, where if you have a property that looks like this, you know, the future is going to be landfill, unfortunately. Then you have other properties where it might not be rehabable, but you can do a process called deconstruction, you know, which is increasingly popular in Detroit in places where you essentially take a property apart, board by board, recycle and reuse as much of it as possible. Right? That can become its own kind of job creator there, and you don't pollute and throw stuff into a landfill. And then there's situations where you have, you know, you catch a house here, and that is something that can be rehabbed. You can put somebody into that house and, and make it occupied again. And what Detroit is dealing with on a basic level is that the city itself accidentally owns about 80,000 properties like that. And that's about, that's about a little less than a quarter of the city right now. It's going to be more than a quarter of the city soon. So these are properties that are technically in the public hands where they're trying to make all those decisions. And then on the private side, you have situations everywhere where it's that block club, it's that neighbor who goes like, I had my eye on this house across the street for years. How do I actually get access to purchasing, developing it, occupying it, renting it, whatever the thing is? And so this tool, this data, is being used to streamline those processes right now. So it, it's, but, it, but it's, it's a slog. You know, I, I wish, one thing I do feel confident about our work in Detroit already is it's kind of move these processes forward like light years. Like it's really like lights coming on in a room, like literally, it's not even, it's almost hardly even a metaphor. It's like, because it's the best kind of metaphor you have, so it's like true, because you couldn't see anything before. And it was like, oh, okay, now we can, we can start to work on it. But to leave with a, you know, with a, a very scary image as well. So if I, you know, close the, side panel here. Every, everything that you're looking at in this map, this is a map of property tax payments in Detroit, and everything that is colored in at all is at least the payment cycle behind on this property taxes. And everything that's orange is tax foreclosable right now, meaning that the city should foreclose on it under state law, take the property into itself. And of these 100,000 properties that are tax foreclosable, about half of them are occupied by people right now which is crazy. So next year when this process happens, this is going to be like a, you almost hate to drop the H word, but it is what it is. It's sort of like a humanitarian um, situation that's going on in Detroit. Because you have so many people who either don't know because they're renters, they've fallen behind in rent, or they've gone into some sort of pro general protest of the system because they're not having services delivered to them. That it's a long way of answering your question and saying that there's a lot to figure out still on that. Because there's every situation under the sun. There's stuff you can fix, there's stuff you can't fix, there's stuff that could be sold. and. Um, you know, again, every, every one of these data lenses sort of is like a, a piece of corrective vision for it. Um, and if you were wondering, you know, this picture kind of shows why the, in a lot of ways, the city went bankrupt because the revenue collection is just not, not happening anymore. Yes? Um, I'm just curious about how you like, got started with this. So, did you start with any database whatsoever when you had this idea? Or did you just have to like, start sending people out and taking pictures? So, we, okay, good question. So, when we started, started, we were crazy people with that in the box over there. And then when we got a little bit past that, the first thing we started with was we got a list of um, tax foreclosure properties that were at being auctioned. And it's the world's largest real estate auction. And nobody else was mapping it, so we kind of mapped it. People found it really valuable. And then from that, we requested from the city, could we have um, two, these uh, shapes that make up every property? These are called parcels. So like the, the citywide, this information is called the parcel shape file. And so we would ask the city, like, can we have the parcel shape file with all the property information? Granted, it's public information. This is a topic of its own. But like, there's a lot of public information that governments don't want to share with you, largely either because it's all on paper and they don't know how, or they're, they're afraid something's wrong with it, or they might not trust your like, intentions on stuff. But anyways, we had a hard time getting the parcel shape file. We eventually had a guy who used to work for the city gave us the parcel shape file for the first time. And we put it online, and the sky didn't fall. And then people got a little bit more used to it in the city. And so for this project, what we started with was every shape of every property in the city, some information about ownership and stuff. And then when, those, when the surveyors went out with their app, it basically works like Google Maps, except that the parcels are on top. So you touch the parcel, and then you fill in that parcel with the information. So it's just starting, starting with the shapes of every property. Yeah. 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 Um, you mentioned a lot about Google Maps, and I think that
right. like the what we like what I was showing here. Yeah. What you do it from your computer. Yeah. The, the only difference your tone is spot on. The only difference is that, as I showed right here, like here's some more photos of a property changing quickly. Sure. To update that, you need to wait for the car to go everywhere. And so if you have a system that does both, is where it's like leading to. So like you have the car do the capture, you survey it from the computer. But then when this, when sadly when this house does this, you're not going to send the car out. You're going to send the the human out. So I, I totally feel it. I think, it's, I think it's, it seems like it's a both kind of a thing. Now, unless you don't want to um, implement Google into your um, project. I think Google has implemented all of us into themselves, so it's the least we could do to uh, implement them right back. Uh, just a question about like, the business side of things. Are, are you all profitable? And if so, how do you make Shockingly, we are right now. I can't believe it because we certainly didn't start out that way. Um, we have both a subscription service that like, we try to make it so that if you're an individual or a small company or a city department, you can like, you know, basically pay like $10 a month, you know, $1,000 a month or like $10,000 a month. And so our business is kind of split between subscriptions and then like missions. Like this Detroit, first Detroit survey was like a mission. It was like, we need you guys to build NASA headquarters and go to the moon of light in 60 days and get us all this information. And we were like, we can totally do that. And then we freaked out and said, can we actually do that? And we did it, and we, and we were paid to do it. Is, is anything that y'all are doing patented, or if I wanted you guys to go out and do the exact same thing? Um, you're totally welcome to try. One of the things that I've learned is, is, <laughs> in, in, in software and web stuff is that it, you, can, you can copy people, I guess, but like it's really hard to like, um, you need to care about what you're doing, and like teams don't suddenly form. We haven't patented anything. I probably should. Every tells me we should try and patent, like, oh, the system for parcel based viewing of public information collected by a city resident. It seems like an awful thing to do to me. You know what I mean? Like, I just, it's not the litig litigious types, but I would love it. We should be competitors. We can try it. We can do that. You said the government kind of made you like a task force. Did they like, give you any funding at all? They, it wasn't federally funded, but the way this program is funded, people are into that. I never know what people are into, but it is kind of interesting. It was a state program in Michigan, the state housing program, two local foundations, the Kresge and Skilling Foundations, um, and Rock Ventures, which is the overarching company of Dan Gilbert, who owns Quicken Loans and the Cleveland Cavaliers and does a lot of stuff in Detroit. So it was a, it was a, it was a partnership of different kind of funders, but it wasn't from, it wasn't from the federal government. But yeah. Sorry, in the, in the head band, yeah, sorry. Um, what do you want to do next? Um, awesome question. I think that I showed you the tax foreclosure stuff, um, this kind of image. Um, I sort of think we have to do this next in Detroit, personally, because, like I said, it's kind of a humanitarian situation. There's going to be 53,000 people in homes that are being foreclosed on, and the city doesn't have a rational way to manage this yet. And I, so I think it's up to, um, it's going to be up to us as a team, Loveland, working with, like, the county treasurer and the city land bank and the mayor's office and stuff. So this is going to be probably pretty important next year. But also this going back to this the street view style stuff. Um, yeah, wait, who wants to think? Google heard what we were talking about. You know, the load anymore. Um, we we want to do a program where it's essentially like we get people excited about surveying the country. You know where it's like because we did half a million properties in Detroit in a short period of time. You add that up. If I, there's some stat. We saw recently, which kind of like led this decision to. Um, but I guess there's a, there's 146 counties in the U.S. that have half the people living in them. So I mean, our country, it's a very big country, but it's where people live is actually really pretty small. Um, so if we get the parcels for the 146 counties, we can actually survey where 175 million people live, and we can invite whoever wants to join over the network to do it. So we're going to try and do like a nationwide crowdsourced surveying campaign. And that's about as far as we can see. Because any one of these things is full of like a million variables and you know other stuff. But but I think pretty cool work. It's, it's exciting. And again, it scratches both those itches of like cool technology, but then also like working with people to do something that affects people where they where they live. Yeah. Since you guys uh, started six years ago, how would you gauge your success uh, program and fighting blight? That's a great, great question. So I think we're successful. We've always been a little bit weird because sometimes people go, like, are you guys still a startup? Have you been doing stuff for like you know five years or something like that? Like how old can a startup be? 
So I mean, you, can, you know, talk to Mary and stuff too. We've been there's kind of different ways you can be an entrepreneur. I think for for us, it was it wasn't the money first piece. It was like there's something interesting going on here. We want to figure out what it is. Frankly, sometimes that takes time to do. And, and in a city like Detroit, it took a long time to build relationships. Like you can't you can't just like hop into it. I mean, you know, Mark Zuckerberg can code Facebook in his dorm room and get there right out to people. When you're actually going into kind of the halls of power and working with government and working with departments who are have ways to do things, and frankly, they're all suspicious of you, and frankly, they probably should be suspicious of you for good reasons, because people show up every day, going, ah, oh, that's a crazy solution that you guys should do, and there's no time for that when you're doing real work. So it took us time, it took us time. Like, it took us, it took us a few years of like showing success and showing up every day and being useful to people before we would get invited to a meeting like that. And now we're sort of in a different era for our company, I think, because now that we've done that, people know that, and it's, it's accelerated for us, do you know what I mean? Like we've, we can kind of like show up and you go like, oh, I'm glad you came. We're looking for something like you rather than who are you. So I think it's been, it feels successful. That's early to say that, but it feels, I don't know. And you had a second part to that? Did you say is, it like, is there any way to gauge the success? Gauge the success. Well, the city of Detroit has cer certainly allocated resources right now to do flight elimination based off of the work. And we get, I wish you could track every piece of it. It's not like web page views, but if you keep somebody at home somehow or if you, get a, a property demolished that really should be. It's hard to track all those things. So the easiest thing we track is, is kind of a weird one, which is like probably like the amount of money that's been spent using this as its dashboard, which is kind of scary too, because at this scale there's always new things that maybe happen suboptimally. So I wish I had a better answer for it, but stuff is it's being used for, for things. Um, they're right here. Uh, a lot of times Detroit is associated with the automotive industry that yep. was used space there, or used to be based there. A lot of times, I think all we've seen as just being that. Um, what long term implications, if any, will there be for the exodus of the automotive industry moving to different parts of the United States and particularly the rest of the world? <laughs> the question might be beyond my pay grade. I, was the, I mean, the, the, um, it's been interesting to watch the Tesla Motors stuff happen in California, too, <laughs> because it seems like that's just a totally different paradigm of like making a vehicle that's more like a cell phone and you just stick bodies on top of that. People sit in, and you know, it's moving towards self-driving and stuff like that. So, transportation futures are interesting. There's still a lot of car stuff around Detroit. It's mostly in the metro Detroit area, so like outside of the city. I, I wish I was better at that. I don't know. Detroit has terrible public transportation. It feels like there's more public transportation is the trend too. So, I'm sorry, I can't be a little bit more insightful <coughs> on that. Um, and then somebody else get back to you too. Is there? Is there someone? Okay. Um, who actually like? Who would you say? Maybe you don't know this, but who actually utilizes your website or your app the most? Like, is it like the average Joe yeah. find a house, like an investor? It's, a, it's an awesome question. So there's I, there's sort of a triangle, and I actually can't tell you which one has the most like sway. So the city service department sees it all day long because it's their kind of like heads up display of what's actually happening in their city, which is great because that kind of splits. I mean, the government's supposed to be the public, right? It doesn't always like work out that way officially. But and then there's. Um, Developers, I guess you'd say, like people who are looking to like invest or rehab or buy and rent or, or whatever they do. So people who are real estate professionals, I guess you'd say. And then there are people, which is sort of the most exciting one, it's the one that we try and keep like as our avatars or like guarding, guarding lights, which is like, you know, the proverbial Miss Jenkins or the, the block club. It's, it's, that, it's the neighbor who's been there, you know, for a long time, who's always active at the meetings, you know, they're always trying to do stuff, make stuff better in the neighborhood, but they've never really been invited into the party very well, and they've certainly never had all the, the information. So it's somewhere between community, city, and developer is the interesting kind of triangle, but I, I think it varies. City uses it all day. Developers probably use it a lot and don't tell us because it's the nature of, you know, you know kind of like, don't broadcast the move. And then we try and help, you know, Miss Jenkins and, and the neighborhood block club um, you know, try to meet their needs with it. So you've been doing this for six years. One could look at your website and say, God, what a hopeless situation. Yes. I'm wondering what you do hope enough to keep doing this. Um, I mean, it's happening. There's no other alternative, I guess. I don't know, I probably want to go back to that weird thing, uh, things out of order type thing. You know, it's like, there's some people go into the building when you say it's on fire and like, you know, some people get out and the world needs firefighters or whatever. Not to put too much on it like we're born firefighters for it, but you know, it's sort of interesting. And it's like, and there's, there's, um, it, some entrepreneurs 
just identify a way to make money, which is fine, it's valid. It's like, oh, if we do this a little bit better, we can, you know, this will be our margin and we should, we should be able to do that. And then there's like another kind, which is just where more, <coughs> my brain personally is the more hours like, whoa, this looks like wrong and weird and challenging and no one's paying attention, so let's slog through kind of like untangling it, and if it doesn't work, we'll approach it from a weird angle. Do you know what I mean? And like, and all this stuff is like, that's sort of, that's just approaching it from a weird angle that's like so obvious once you can understand that it's actually possible to be like, you know, it's like that moment where it's like, huh, photograph every property in Detroit if we're looking for play. Is that a good idea? No, it's the best idea. It's the only, you know what I mean? There's other stuff you need to do too, but it's something that needs to happen. Otherwise, you're just kind of like, I don't know, playing play elevator music to it. You know what I mean? Like, you can't. Is that even an expression? It is now. So you, you have the three people or groups that are using right. this thing. Are there any urban planners using it? Yeah, and that's they fall, it all falls in. Like I put the you know what I mean if there was a diagram, they'd be closer to the city. See the, the one of the weird things, and that's why it's kind of accidentally a cool business too. I don't want to say accidentally a cool business because we're trying to grow the business and make it better, you know, generating the revenue that we need for growth and everything else. But it's so fundamental that it touches a lot of people. Do you know what I mean? It's like in some ways, like you know, the, wor the worst thing when you hear like an entrepreneur talking about the thing, like who's it for? And they're like, everybody, man. Do you know what I mean? It's not always a good sign, so you need to narrow it down. But in some in some ways, we kind of have an everybody, man, like a little bit, at least for right now. Actually, I think it's one of our weaknesses. Like somebody could be a little bit more specific in some areas, and we go back. But right now, it's like you need to paint a picture for everybody. Because it does, it's not like urban planners have their own tool that's necessarily better. And I don't want to say we're the only tool out there. There's a lot of great mapping, and I, I don't want to say that. But when it comes to like collecting information from the field, combined with loading up different data sets and like putting it onto onto you know searchable map where you get down by by neighborhood type and everything else, like we have a really we built a really good tool for that. Seeing how dysfunctional the government sector has been with helping Detroit, and it seems like you, the private sector, has been very efficient in helping Detroit. Do you think that it would make sense if other <coughs> government services were moved to the private sector in terms of finalizing Detroit? And fascinating and frightening um, question. Because it's, it's sort of the trend right now. And I think everybody's trying to handle it like, and where's the, where's the, where's the gong here? Am I in? Okay. I'm getting, getting on. Okay. The, um, so, like for example, Detroit right now already has um, what's called an emergency manager, and so this is, I think it's, as it's written, it's unique to Michigan, but basically the governor of Michigan, um, Governor Rick Snyder, has, and he's done this in a few other cities in Michigan, has said that the finances and city service situation in Detroit are so bad that we're going to set aside the authority of the mayor and city council, and we're going to impose this person, the emergency manager, who's able to do things like erase union contracts and cut vendor contracts and change laws and change policies. And um, that right there is crazy. That's not, that's not privatizing something, but it's, there's sort of a recognition where it's like, whoa, 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 the system's so gummed up, it's not working. And in fact, you know, what they try to shut it, and it's a hard thing to talk, it's a longer conversation to talk about, because it frankly gets to like an emotional core of what a democracy is. Like, is that undemocratic? Or is that actually, is that part of how a democracy keeps from failing completely is that the state level is allowed to say, look, you all have freedom to do stuff, except if you get this messed up in some way, then we're gonna do this, you know, until till it gets back right again. And in Detroit, where there's not a lot of money for stuff you do have, you have um, foundations buy at least part of um, cop cars. You know, they bought, the, there's a lot of stuff that gets purchased. There's a, a new light rail system going to the main street of Detroit that's paid for entirely with um, with with philanthropic and, and um, uh, private funds from local businesses. During the bankruptcy, one of the most interesting cases on this is I don't know if you guys follow this at all. Probably not. But long story short, the city owed like 17 billion dollars of long-term debt. Um, a lot of that was the people who retired from working for the city. So these are people you really want to see get paid because they were going back to that you know population piece. When you're growing like this, you're going to make a lot of promises to people. Do you know what I mean? Because you're like, our growth is going to be like this for a while. We're going to have a lot of money. I'm not sure. You retire, you get this much money. That's fine. And then everybody who's there afterwards is paying off the legacy of that, that happening. And so when you get a drop like this, you can't pay anymore. And these are real contracts, real promises made to real people and stuff. And 
one thing that we saw that the city has, um, going back to its great assets, not just play, has an amazing art collection. Um, the Detroit Institute of Arts has a multi-billion dollar art collection, which kind of moved to like a center row seat in the bankruptcy. And, and there were a lot of people saying, sell the art, you know, sell the art, save the pensions, you know. And then, but there was private money and, and, and foundation money that actually stepped in and put together, Mary, do you remember what the size on that? I forget, it was almost a billion, it was about a billion dollars, I think, in money that was like private money to go and pay city retirees so that the art wouldn't have to be sold. Really amazing, but everything's tangled, basically. I think it was 800. It was 800 million, something like that, like appro approaching a million. But really tangly, public-private, really tangly. And, all, and obviously a lot of emotions around that because, you know, we, it's a representational government of people and it gets really kind of weird when some of those things, like, because you take it to the extreme, it's like what happens if you had, you know, pushed out there, you know, court or, you know, all medical and, and police was like run by, you know, Google, Google, you know, or, or, you know, I'm not trying to make Google sound embarrassed, Some, something that actually was, be really interesting, you know what I mean, and then you get money into that, like, who gets faster service, kind of like a net neutrality thing, like, oh, pick you up fast in the cop bar, if you, and that kind of stuff is not happening in Detroit, but it is, it is tangled, it's a, it's a question, city doesn't have money, private people and foundations have money, so, how do you sort it out, open question. Do one last question last before question. we cut. Okay. Just a uh, quick question, please. You can point on to the corrupt politics that were going on in Detroit um, and link it to Detroit going under. Was Detroit going under uh, an unavoidable fate for it in some ways, or was it just because of the corrupt politics? It could have been avoided. That's an awesome question. I, I mean, of course these things can be avoided on stuff. You have I don't know, two, two, long, two long conversations to, to play out fully. But again, I think a lot of this stuff goes back to this, this image right here. Because you put, like, how many people have left the city? And so if you're losing your tax base like that, something has to give at some point. There's all sorts of stuff that probably could have been done to make the city more attractive for people to stay in, or more cooperative solutions could have been come up with. I can't say, and frankly, in some ways, I feel like I'm too new to the city. I feel very, Detroit is my adopted home, and I feel very comfortable there now, but it's only been about six years. So my cycle of like time there isn't huge. So I sort of want to punt that to, you know, it's like I think our job is to help illuminate, not to judge too much, but I think your question is a really interesting one. Was it was it essentially inevitable by the way that it was being managed? And um, there was a lot of it's it's non controversial to say there's a lot of a lot of non cooperation, a lot of gridlock in the city and not a lot of like really systemic solutions to problems. Piecemeal stuff and, and grandstanding and then and then Unfortunately, corruption, like you mentioned. The last mayor, well, now the mayor before last, actually went to jail on racketeering charges, like what, you know, people in the mafia, it's the law that was designed for, for um, dealing with that kind of, running the city as a criminal organization. So, I don't know. Yeah. But thank you, for, thank you everybody for your time. So, thank you.